Hey everyone, Kyle here for School of Motion. We're back for part two of our title sequence upgrade. If you haven't checked out the first video, I recommend doing that to hear about some of the concepts behind what we're doing today. In this video, we'll be bringing this project fully into After Effects and taking advantage of various compositing tools to alter or remove some distracting elements in our footage. Let's get started. Let's begin with a quick review of our title sequence and what we're planning to do with it. Since we're concentrating on footage fixes today, I've turned off the actual titles for now. Remember, our goal is to make sure there's nothing in our footage that distracts the audience from the things we do want them to be looking at. We also have one or two creative notes that we might as well do while we're in here. Last time, we made a list of the things we're going to be addressing. We have these signs in several shots that need the existing content either removed or replaced. That's a pretty common request, so that'll be a good one to know. I'd like to add a flare to help us feel consistent coming into this third shot. We've got these lights in the background of this shot and this shot, and I'd like to see if I can minimize or remove those. I'd like to make our lead actor pop just a bit more in this final shot, and last but definitely not least, we're going to see if we can erase this background guy from the end of this shot. There's actually a lot of workflow strategy mixed into this demo, and as an editor, I know you'll appreciate the value of that. This also brings up an important point I wanna make before we start. If at all possible, you wanna make sure your edit is 100% locked before you do this kind of work. Tasks like motion tracking and rotoscoping can be time consuming and sometimes kind of tedious to get right. So you wanna make sure you're not wasting your time perfecting something that's just gonna be thrown away. Part of your role might be helping your project's decision makers understand, nicely of course, that yes, we understand that you want him to disappear, and yes, that will happen, but they might need to learn to look past it for a few versions until the edit is approved. Then we'll circle back and make everything look perfect. For the sake of this tutorial, we're assuming we've been through a few edit versions and now everything so far is approved, so we're confident we can move forward with our compositing work. You'll also want to be mindful of your color correction workflow. If you're doing it yourself using Adobe Native Tools like I have here, you can be pretty flexible. If your color's being done by another artist or in another piece of software, make sure you communicate very carefully to confirm whether color should happen before or after these footage fixes. It matters. I made sure to create an export of my timeline so that I can use that for reference as we go further. If we just had a single shot or a few shots that needed work, that previous technique I showed you, where you right click and replace with After Effects composition, is a great way to go. But after looking at my list, I realized the first shot is the only one without some kind of effects work. We'll probably also be reusing some elements and techniques between shots, like for the signs. So I think it makes sense to just send this whole project to After Effects. Before that though, I'd like to simplify this timeline a bit. That'll make it easier and cleaner to import and to work with. Up here in the project panel, let's right click the sequence and choose duplicate. We always want a backup, right? I'll rename this new one with 2AE at the end. Double click that to make sure you're working on the proper copy down in your timeline. Okay, let's simplify. You can see we have two tracks of clips here, but since the edit is now locked, I'm gonna highlight everything on the second track and hit Alt or Option down arrow to collapse it into one video track and a single clean edit. We're gonna be totally redesigning these titles in the next video, so I'm actually just gonna delete those along with this black layer. After Effects isn't great for audio work, so I'm actually just gonna drop my reference export in here to handle that part. I'll save my project and now it's time for After Effects. As an editor, you know organization is important, so we're gonna do some prep work as we come into After Effects to set ourselves up for success. We'll also take a really quick tour of the UI in case you're not already familiar. I'm here in a brand new After Effects file. I'll come up here to File, Import, Import Adobe Premiere Project. Navigate to your project file and click Open. This little dialog box will pop up, and if you have more than one sequence in your project, just choose the one you want. This will import all the media in your Premiere project, even if it's not used in this timeline. So if you have other clips that aren't being used, you probably wanna trim your project down even further before you get to this step. The After Effects project panel works just like using List View in Premiere's project panel. You can see this imported my existing folder structure, so if your project was already well organized, it'll still be that way. You're free to rearrange this as you like, though. I'm gonna pull these elements out of that main folder and go ahead and delete that empty one. 
You can see our sequence right here, though in After Effects these are called compositions. You can think of it like a cross between a timeline and a Photoshop file. Let's double click that, and now we can see all our imported clips down here on the timeline. In case your After Effects looks different than mine, notice the different workspaces up here, just like in Premiere, and that I'm in the default workspace right now. The basics of the UI should all feel pretty familiar. You have a project panel where you keep your clips and graphics. You have a viewer where you see what you're working on, and down here you have a timeline. We'll be using some of these other panels later, but don't worry about those yet. The After Effects timeline is laid out more vertically because it works with layers instead of tracks. So no two elements can occupy the same vertical space in here. Whatever's on top is what will be visible. Right now, that's our reference edit. We'll want to see our actual clips, so let's disable the visibility by clicking this little eyeball switch. You can see the little speaker is still enabled though, which means we'll still be able to hear the audio from this layer. Here in After Effects, you can also see the unused portions of your clips. See this grayed out area here? The work I did in Premiere came over just fine. If I twirl open one of these clips, you can see some have keyframes for the time remapping I did in Premiere, which is why these other clips don't show that unused clip area. We can also see a Lumetri color effect I added and any transform changes I made. I can zoom in or out in the viewer using my mouse wheel or controller command with plus minus. Now you can easily see the bounding box of our clip. Much easier to visualize that reframing in here, isn't it? If you didn't already have your clips named in Premiere, as you can see was the case here, you definitely want to do that now. You can rename a layer by hitting Enter, typing a new name, and then hitting Enter again to close that out. After Effects isn't aware of Premiere's clip colors, but you can color code your layers in here by clicking on this little color chip. I'm going to set this first clip to green since it doesn't need any work, and then I'll select all the rest and set those to yellow since they do have work to be done. Oh, one more thing, we haven't saved our project yet. Let's go up to File, Save, or hit Ctrl or Command S, just like you expect. For my specific project, I think it makes sense to nest each shot, so any other layers we may need to add will stay nicely organized within a nice little container. In After Effects, that's called pre-composing, but it's very similar to making a nested sequence in Premiere. You can do this with one layer or several layers all at once. The time remapping on some of my clips does add a little extra complexity, but if that doesn't apply to your project, don't worry about it. Time remapping is a fairly common technique for editors though, and the way it intersects with some of the other work we're doing can be a little confusing at first, so I thought it would be a good example. Stick with me. Let's start with O3 Kick ECU. I'm going to pre-compose just this layer by selecting it and then go to Layer, Pre-compose, or use the hotkey Control or Command Shift C. You get an opportunity to rename it, but I'm fine with this. And in this case, I want to leave all attributes, meaning the time remapping, lumetry, and transform adjustments will stay here in the main composition, and I'll be nesting only the raw clip. OK. You'll notice the icon for this layer changed from a video file to a composition, and it added our new composition up here in the project panel. Let's double click this to open it up. You'll see we now have two compositions open in our timeline panel, and the viewer updates to show the one you're currently working in. Because After Effects is built to be very flexible, and because we sent only the raw clip in here, now there's nothing to indicate where the edit points are out in the main composition, so I'm going to create those manually. Clicking back to my main composition, I'm going to go to the first frame of this segment by hitting the I key. Since these clips have been time remapped, I'm also going to hit U, which reveals all keyframes on the layer, and I'll double check the time here at this first frame, 18.02. Now if I double click this again, it'll bring me into that composition at exactly this time. I'd like to mark that, so I'll hit the asterisk key to create a marker. I'll hop back to my main composition, hit O to jump to the out point, and again note the time code here, 2203. I'll double click again and, okay, like I said, the time remapping adds a little extra wrinkle here, which is why I paid attention to that time code. So the end of this clip in my main timeline is actually up here at 2203 so I'll make my marker up there. I'm going to set up my work area within this shot that's like Premiere's in and out by hitting N to set the end, and I'll scrub back to that first marker and hit B for beginning. If I do a quick preview by hitting spacebar, you can see we've dialed in the intended area of our clip, but without the time remapping, color, or transforms, we left those behind in the main composition. If I open up the settings for this composition, you'll notice that we're also working at this clip's original 4K resolution in here, unlike our edit, which you might remember is only 1920 by 1080. These extra pixels might come in handy. I know this added some steps, but it can be very helpful having full access to that unedited clip. If it turns out that our edit isn't 100% locked, you know how it goes. 
Once you start doing compositing work in here, you still got some flexibility if it turns out you need an extra five frames from this shot. Okay, we're diving into the actual techniques now. Since you probably aren't using the exact same footage I have, I want you to pay attention to the workflow and the thought process. Don't worry so much about the exact values I'm using. Our first task is trying to match this flare just to make the cut feel a bit better. I think we can pull that off. Let's come in here and I'll right click somewhere in this empty area. Choose new, solid. Let's rename that to flare and I'll make sure this is full black. Yep, okay. We'll come up to effects and presets and search for flare and we'll use this lens flare. Just drag it onto your layer. The stock lens flare is kind of dated, but I think it'll work fine here. The first thing I need to do is change the blending mode so we can see this over the footage. I'll click this little thing to toggle between switches and modes and then set my mode to screen. I'm gonna change this flare type to the 105 millimeter prime. Okay, not bad. And you'll see I get a little control to move this around. I'll move it to like right here. Let's click these little stopwatches on flare center and flare brightness. Remember that hotkey to reveal the keyframes? U. You can adjust these here in effect controls or down here on the timeline. They all exist in both places. I'm gonna move forward a bit. This clip has some camera movement that kind of stops around here. I think I can kind of just eyeball this honestly and I'm gonna scoot this out of frame. Move that just a few frames later. And the camera kind of eases to a stop, so I'm going to ease my keyframe by pressing F9. That'll give us a nice smooth landing. I'll hit spacebar to do a quick preview and see how that feels. Okay, I think we're getting somewhere. Let's go back to this first keyframe. Maybe brighten it up just a bit more and then come up here, maybe not even quite to that other keyframe, and drop this brightness quite a bit. That's kind of what I'm going for. Just a little kiss of this lens flare right at the beginning of the shot. I should fade that off more. I'm noticing this little blip here. I'll just fade that all the way off. I think this works pretty well, but it's definitely not matching the color of the other lens flares. Again, I think we can probably just eyeball this. Come back to effects and presets and look for curves. Drag this over here. Let's drop the blue channel. Maybe pump the reds a little bit. On RGB, let's just make a nice S curve to bump the contrast. That feels pretty good. Let's go back to our main comp, see how it feels. Notice that I've set my work area in this composition too, so I'm only previewing this little section. You know what? I'm happy with that. For this shot, we're trying to make our lead actor pop just a bit more, and I tried doing this in Premiere first. I've just got a second copy of Lumetri with a slight exposure boost, and I've created some masks, which actually tracked pretty well. But when he tosses the ball in front of his face, Premiere just didn't know what to do with the tracking. This ball is on screen for like 150 frames total, and I don't know about you, but I have better things to do with my time than trying to frame by frame this, especially here in Premiere. Even if it did track cleanly, there's also really no way to subtract this mask from the effect, which is what I actually need to do. After Effects to the rescue! The mask tracking I could do in Premiere came over when I imported, so we have a good start. In this case, when I'm creating that pre-composition for this shot, I still want to choose Leave Attributes, but then I'm going to manually cut and paste the two good masks and the second Lumetri effect directly onto the clip inside the pre-composition. Make sure you're pasting at the same frame. It does matter. You might think, oh no, that mask doesn't go all the way down. But remember, this is reframed in the main composition, so we can't see that anyway. Okay, our plan is to trim this ball out of the exposure boost. I could try a couple different approaches to extract this shape, but I think Roto Brush will probably do a good job for our purposes here. I'll start by duplicating my layer with Control or Command D, then hit UU to reveal anything that's been changed from the default settings. Now I can easily grab the masks and this effect and delete those, because we don't need them for this top copy. I'll scrub up here to where the ball leaves the screen and come up to Edit, Split or you can hit Ctrl or Command, Shift, D. Let's find the spot the ball comes back into frame, and I can trim this layer by dragging it or by hitting Alt or Option and the open bracket. Let's be tidy and rename those. Now I'll double click this first cover clip, grab my Roto Brush tool from the toolbar up here, and then I can just loosely paint the ball surface. This thing is usually pretty smart, so you don't actually need to trace the edges. But since it's got a few different colors in here, you might have to stroke a few times to get the whole shape. 
I can move frame by frame by pressing page up or page down. And as I go through the frames, if I see something I need to add, I can just paint that in. Or I can subtract from the area by holding Alt or Option while using the brush. I don't care about the left side of the ball too much since that doesn't intersect him. So if it's messy over there, no big deal. I'm also going to be feathering this a little bit, so it doesn't have to be 100% perfect over here. When I get done painting that in, I'll just click this freeze button down here, so After Effects knows it doesn't need to think about this anymore. Make sure to click back into your composition so you're not still in this isolated layer view. And if I toggle this little solo button, you can see we have a cutout of our ball. I'll repeat this for the other part of the shot. And I think if I make just a few adjustments in the roto brush effect settings, bring the feathering up a bit, bring the contrast down, I'm going to be pretty happy with the results. Since we have a few 4K layers in here, it might take just a second for the preview to build. Okay, we've got our actor a bit brighter, but we kept the ball from getting that same exposure boost. While we're in here, I'm noticing that the left side of his face probably doesn't need that boost, since it's already very bright. So I'll come up here and grab my pen tool, make sure the bottom clip is selected, and draw one more mask over here. I'll set that to none so I can see what I'm doing. And with my mask selected, I can open up the tracker panel here and do the same kind of mask tracking that you're used to in Premiere. Even with the ball flying through here, it does pretty well. My Lumetri effect is already using those two previous masks, but I'll need to tell it to use this new mask to cut away from the effect. We'll set the mask to subtract. Don't panic and then twirl open the Lumetri effect and look for compositing options. You can see it's already using these other two masks, so we'll just click this little plus button and it'll grab our new mask. Oops, we better feather that. Twirl open the mask and just crank up the feathering right here. So compared to the original, you can see we have a nice little exposure boost without accidentally getting the ball and without overexposing his left side too much. And best of all, After Effects did most of the work for us. If you have something you need cut out for whatever reason, hop in here and give Roto Brush a shot. Bonus tip, somewhere in the course of making my demo, I accidentally nudged this one shot out of its original position. Oops. Fortunately, there's an easy fix for that. If I come back to Premiere, I can select that clip and Controller Command C to copy. Hop back to After Effects, Controller Command V to paste, and hey, you can copy paste stuff directly between the two apps. I don't need the whole clip, but I can twirl this open, copy the position from it, paste that to my shot, and then delete this clip. Good as new. We have a lot of these signs to fix, so I'll start with an easy one. This shot doesn't move too much, and nothing crosses in front of these two signs on the right. I've imported this logo to replace the one in the clip. It's an Illustrator file, but any image will work. I'll just bring that down into my composition above my clip. Before I start tracking, I'm going to create another special kind of layer that will help us hold the tracking data in an easy-to-use way. I'll come up to Layer, New, Null Object. In the middle of my composition, it creates this little red box. These aren't visible in previews or exports, and they only exist so you can attach other things to them. I'll name this Track Data because that's what it's going to hold. Now I'll select my clip, open up my Tracker panel, and click Track Motion. It opens this layer in an isolated viewer, and I get a little point right here. I'm going to zoom way in and start dragging this into place. I'll hold my spacebar to temporarily activate the hand tool so I can freely drag around in my viewer. I'll try this little point at the very top of the building. You're really just looking for unique pixels with some contrast. I'd like a second point for more accurate track, so I'll make sure to select both position and rotation. Once I do that, it creates a second point for me, which I'll put down here on the shield. And then I click Analyze, either forward or backward, depending on where you are in your clip. And we can stop it once we get past the bounds for our work area. I usually like to go a little bit past, just in case we need that later. If I open this up, you'll see the tracker created two points with frame-by-frame -frame position data. And now that my tracking is complete, I'll click Edit Target in my tracker panel, make sure that's pointing towards track data, and then hit Apply, and OK. It creates position and rotation keyframes using that tracker data, and now if I scrub, you'll see that this null held on pretty well. And if I bring my logo mark down to the right area, zoom in nice and tight here, scale it, little bit of rotation, just trying to get it as close as I can. Back down in my timeline, on my logo layer, I'm going to grab this little curly cue thing. It's called a pick whip, and I'm going to drag that up to track data. 
Once I let go, my logo layer is now parented to track data, meaning it'll follow that layer wherever it goes. Great, now I just need to make this logo look like it belongs here. I think if I use a tritone effect, grab a white from my clip, grab a black from my clip, and I might try my midtones from the shield that it's replacing. Okay, that looks pretty good. I'll also add fast box blur because this shield definitely isn't sharp in focus. I'll just sneak this up until it feels like it matches, maybe about eight. I'm also going to create a little white shape to cover up that old logo. If I come up to my toolbar, I can grab my ellipse tool. Making sure I have no other layer selected, if I just click drag to start drawing, it'll create what's called a shape layer. Click the fill and eyedropper from this white. I also need to parent this to track data and drag that below my logo layer. I'll rename that cover. Let's copy that same blur from the logo and paste. I think my new logo is still standing out a little too much, so I'll select it, hit T to reveal opacity, and bring that down to 70 something. Looks good. We can use this same process to create a text layer if we want to name this building. And now we just have to repeat this process across the other shots. Several of these signs have objects that pass in front of them, but fortunately you know how to use Rotobrush now. Even on something like this that I thought would be really challenging because the building is almost the same color as his hand, it actually did great here. Since most of these move across pretty quickly, even if we have to do a few of them manually using the masking tools, it's not too painful. There are some other trackers available here in After Effects, including a planar tracker and a 3D camera tracker. Those are both a little more complicated to use, but they're really useful for tasks like screen replacements or when your shot involves more camera movement. I've got a few more tricks to show you, but if you're interested in learning more about After Effects' compositing tools and the cool stuff you can do with them, you should check out our VFX for Motion course taught by industry legend Mark Christensen. VFX for Motion is a completely unique learning experience like nothing you've ever seen. You'll work your way through several very different projects, each targeting a specific set of skills that motion designers may be asked to utilize in their work. We also enlisted the help of some incredible designers, giving you elements to work with that will push your skills and your portfolio. You'll learn how to rotoscope the right way using tracking and other techniques to assist you. You'll get really good at pulling keys, even challenging ones. You'll learn how to use the point tracker, Mocha's planar tracker, and the camera tracker. We'll go over many different compositing tricks to make your elements sit perfectly in your scene, and you'll learn a million and one new things about After Effects that you didn't know existed. You'll be assigned a teaching assistant, an industry pro, to give you feedback on your coursework and to help you with any troubleshooting. And you'll be doing all this with a group of students from around the world who are learning alongside you. Sign up for the next session of VFX for Motion, and we hope to see you in class. You know I had to save the best for last, right? To finish up, we'll take a look at content-aware fill. There's obviously no such thing as a magic button, but this comes pretty close. Content-aware fill is great for removing unwanted objects from your shots, so I decided I'd do a super serious demonstration by making this ball disappear. Using masks, rotobrush, or other methods, you just cut out your unwanted object. You're basically punching a hole through your footage. You can see the checkerboard here, meaning this area is transparent, and that tells After Effects what area to fill in. You have a few different settings here in the Content-Aware Fill panel, depending on the context of your shot and what kind of thing you're removing. Really though, you just click this button and let After Effects work some magic. Ta-da! So that was fun, but let's be honest, removing this whole rugby player is going to be ambitious. It's a big area and a very complex background. I'm using Rotobrush again here, and I figured it would take some work to cut him out properly, but honestly, once I got his outline painted in, I barely had to touch it. There's one important difference here though. Before I clicked freeze, there's a little checkbox here in the Rotobrush controls that lets you invert your selection, so it'll be removing this object instead of isolating it. Running content-aware fill on this entire shape, I ended up with something that's honestly pretty impressive. There are a few little artifacts in here, but this is just my first attempt, and remember, we need to be looking at this in context. Could you tell there was anything here? Because I can't. Truthfully, I expected to be running this a couple times with different settings and probably doing it in multiple smaller pieces, which are good strategies when it doesn't work this well. But hey, I'm definitely not complaining. 
If Content Aware Phil can do this, it's definitely worth trying next time someone asks you to remove a little logo, right? We just covered a lot, so I'm glad you stuck with me. We've got a few things left on our list, but with the techniques we covered today, finishing those up should be no problem. Armed with tools like motion tracking, Rotobrush, and Content Aware Fill, you'll be surprised how many of these footage fixes you used to dread become no sweat. We focused on fixes and object removal today, but these compositing techniques are also kind of a gateway to a whole new world of creative possibilities. In our final video, we'll take a more thoughtful approach to the design and animation of our titles and see if we can take those from good enough to being artistic and visually meaningful. You won't want to miss that last video, so make sure to subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so you'll be notified when it comes out. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.